Hello and welcome to the Fabulous at 50 podcast, celebrating a vibrant global community of women over 50 through entertaining interviews that will inspire, educate, and empower. Your host, Joanne Nuaduck, was born to nurture and promote vibrance. Joanne is both the Community Director for Calgary, Canada, and oversees the global operations for Fabulous at 50. As an oncology nurse, integrative practitioner in multiple modalities, life skills mentor and manager, Joanne moves people from challenging situations to positive outcomes through the use of her innate gifts and learned skills. Here's your host, Joanne Nuaduck. Hello and welcome to the Christmas episode of Fabulous at 50. I know that 2020 has been, to say the least, a challenging year for most. But right now we're sitting just a couple days out from Christmas and I wanted to bring a little joy. I'm not interviewing anyone today. I am sharing with you instead a tradition that my family shares on Christmas Eve. Now we have a fairly large blended family with five kids ranging from 21 to 31. And for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, we extend our dining table well into the living room typically and have these big sit down, wonderful meals with friends and family being invited. And that's simply not going to happen this year. And that's okay because Christmas is about sharing love and we can do that whether we're together in person or we're coming together through other means of telephone calls and FaceTime and Zoom calls whatever it takes we will be together and one of the things that our family does as a tradition is to gather around the Christmas tree just before we go to bed on Christmas Eve and read the story Twas the Night Before Christmas. Now, many years ago, I got the book called The Visit. And The Visit is written um, by a gentleman who would go and visit his grandfather back in the 1930s. And his grandfather would share the story of his grandfather in 1822, Clement C. Moore, who is the author of Twas the Night Before Christmas. And this book called The Visit tells the story behind the story. And it's written in three parts. The first part is how the author of this book and his family would travel to New York to visit his grandfather. And then his grandfather would tell the children the story about Twas the Night Before Christmas. And that's what I want to read to you today. I'd like to share a bit of our tradition and share it with you. So sit back and enjoy. We're going to start at part two. It's called Grandfather's Account, New York City, late December, 1936. I shall start out this tale with some little known facts that have long been forgotten or slipped through the cracks. Dr. Clement Clark Moore, was my grandfather's name, but to all he was Papa, friends and family the same. Papa Moore was a scholar. He wrote many fine texts, though none are more famous than the one I'll tell you next. He conceived his new poem in 1822 on Christmas Eve day. Yes, the legend is true. So much has been changed since he wrote his good verse, some things for the better, some things for the worse. Take clothing, for instance. Though this might seem shocking, as children each night, we would wash out our stockings. We rubbed them and scrubbed them and hung them to dry by the chimney with care, as the tale will imply. Now, some good folks today might just readily assume that we'd hang up those stockings to dry in our rooms. And though I admit that it would have been nice, I'm afraid if we had, they'd have frozen to ice. 
for the bedrooms back then were so rarely with heat that it often took hours just to warm up our feet. And this explains why, when we took a long nap, Mama Moore wore her kerchief and Papa a bed cap. Granddad gave us a nod, cleared his throat, sipped his tea, then resumed his account of how things used to be. Sugar plum is a word that's unheard of nowadays, but we made them with fruit rolled in sugary glaze. Then we'd wrap them and store them and soon they'd become the delicious jellied candy we called sugar, sugar plum. They glittered by firelight and tasted supreme, and often that vision would dance in my dreams. Papa's farm, he continued, sat on an old street in a section called Chelsea that was somewhat elite. His house, tall and handsome, had windows galore, which caused quite a problem he could not ignore. For in the winter, the wind blew through each window crack. Not having storm windows was quite a drawback. So dear Papa hung shutters both inside and out, which explains how the line of his poem came about. Away to the window, I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. One last line of the poem that I'd like to explain is more rapid than eagles is coursers they came. As you know, in the winter in Papa Moore's day, many folks often traveled through snow in a sleigh and teams that pulled sleighs, whether horses or deer, were commonly known as coursers that year. Now part three, a visit to Papa's. Then Granddad became quiet, settled back in his chair, took a sip of his tea, ran a hand through his hair. He murmured so softly, now, how did it go? I must tell you exactly, must recount it just so. Ah, yes, I remember. He said soft and low, it was Christmas Eve day. He began soft and slow. Twilight was just falling upon the Moore house when out of the kitchen came Papa Moore's spouse. Dear Papa, she inquired, will you travel to town? and buy a goose from the butcher before he closes down. And don't forget that you promised your daughter upstairs a new Christmas story to lighten her cares. You see, their daughter was sickly, quite feeble and lame, confined to her bed. Charity Moore was her name. And the one gift that Charity had asked for that year was a simple new story from her Papa dear. So Papa rushed to the barn, harnessed coursers to sleigh, and with a flick of the reins, they were soon on their way. The night sky was clear, filled with twinkling stars, but that was soon to change before they had traveled too far. For dark stormy clouds soon began to roll in and to fill the night sky where the stars had once been. And before my dear Papa could whisper Jack Frost, a thick snow was falling. He soon became lost. But his coursers, those horses had traveled each day to the town so they knew where to pull his good sleigh. They crossed through the meadow, through the forest and stream, 
as if they were floating through a mid-winter's dream. But just as they reached the far edge of the river, the horses pulled up, they stopped and they quivered and blew steam from their noses and they huffed and they puffed as if to say to Papa, we've gone far enough. And suddenly, just like magic, the snow disappeared and the moon shone its face as the clouds slowly cleared and the wind started blowing which made everything freeze and the snow turned to diamonds on the fields and the trees and the moon on the breast of the new fallen snow gave the luster of midday to objects below. Papa Moore was enchanted, mesmerized by the scene. Twas the most beautiful sight that he had ever seen. He looked down the hill toward the village below, watching friends running last minute chores through the snow. And from his lofty perch in his sleigh on the hill, Papa caught a slight movement behind the old mill. He watched as the figure in a red coat and hood drew a sled through the town full of fresh chopped wood. He recognized the old woodman as the kindly Jean Peter, who was well loved in town for no man could be sweeter. He had a white beard and a heart made of gold. He was rotund and jolly and appeared very old. He smoked a clay pipe as he managed his chores, his nose cherry red from his work out of doors. Now Jean Paul Sorry, Jean Peter was known as a teller of tales who enchanted his friends with his charming portrayals. He'd sit by the stove at the general store, encircled by children curled up on the floor. And he'd entertain them with his tales of delight of the Dutchman Saint Nicholas and his journeys at night. And if they were if they were good, he would give each a treat, a delicious sweet sugar plum candy to eat. But this night he appeared to be up to no good as he traveled through town with his wagon of wood. He creeped down an alley, then reached back in his sleigh leave a small pile of something, then hurry away. And as Papa sat watching, it soon became clear what Jean Peter was doing in the alleyways there. He was leaving his tinder beside every door of the folks in the town who were hungry and poor. Jean Peter was giving the one gift that he could a warm Christmas for all, with the gift of his wood. Papa's eyes filled with tears as he watched his old friend, who hadn't a penny nor a dollar to spend, offer kindness and love to those people in need. And he thought, what a good man, what a true saint indeed. And as Papa sat there, so content in his sleigh on that hill Christmas Eve on that long ago day. He thought of his daughter and her simple request, and he thought of his family and how they were blessed. And he thought of Jean Peter and his selfless good deeds, and he thought of how love is all the world needs. And twas then, in an instant, Papa knew he would write a new Christmas story for his daughter that very night. He would fill it with magic, with such wonder and joy that it'd be known the world over by all girls and boys. It's, because, became, sorry, it's become a great classic that I'm sure you've heard of, this gift to his daughter Papa's gift of his love. Oh yes, 
Papa did make the butcher in time and brought Mama her goose while conceiving his rhyme. And now, without further ado, here's the tale Papa wrote for his daughter that Christmas, and from here I shall quote. And in this book, it is actually in Clement C. Moore's handwriting, and it says, written in 1862, March 13th, originally written many, many years ago, as we mentioned in 1822. Twas the night before Christmas, went all through the house. Not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care, in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds, while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. And Mama in her kerchief and I in my cap had just settled our brains for a long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new fallen snow gave the luster of midday to objects below. When what to my wondering eye should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer. With a little old driver so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be Saint Nick. More rapid than eagles his coursers they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donder and Blitzen, to the top of the porch, to the top of the wall. Now dash away, dash away, dash away all. As dry leaves that before the wild hurricane fly, when they meet with an obstacle, mount to the sky. So up to the housetop the coursers they flew, with the sleigh full of toys and St. Nicholas too. And then in a twinkling I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. As I drew in my head and was turning around, down the chimney St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes how they twinkled, his dimples how merry, his cheeks were like roses and his nose like a cherry. His drawl little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard on his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of his pipe he held tight in his teeth, and the smoke it encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf, and I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work, and he filled all the stockings then turned with a jerk, and laying his finger aside of his nose, giving a nod, up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle, and away they all flew like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim, ere he drove out of sight, Happy Christmas to all, and to all a good night. I hope you've enjoyed listening to one of our traditions and that you find a way of making your traditions work for you this year. I just want to end with what the um, author wrote here. It says, Dear readers and lovers of Christmas, I would like to share with you my wonderful Christmas memory. In 1822, my grandfather's grandfather, Clement C. Moore created a delightful Christmas poem for his ailing daughter 
as his Christmas gift to her that year, he did not realize at the time that it was destined to become a classic. Well, this certainly is a classic and it's the tradition that um, my family enjoys amongst many other things, including baking and, and um, you know, opening our presents <laughs> and leaving, throwing carrots and oatmeal out on the front lawn for the reindeer to come and eat. I'm sure we have quite a few deer in our neighborhood, so I'm sure the deer actually really do come and eat it. And there's, there's just so many ways that we can hold the magic in our heart. And in I, and I'm, I'm choosing this year, instead of being sad for those that I can't be with in person, I am treasuring the times we have been together in person. I am holding on to the hope, knowing that we will once again be together in person and that we will just find creative ways to be together. And maybe that's simply reading stories to each other. So I wish you all the blessings of this season and a Merry Christmas. Or perhaps I should say what the story says is happy Christmas to all and to all a good night. Thanks for joining us today. You've been listening to the Fabulous at 50 podcast with your host, Joanne Neuaduck. Join us again for more inspirational interviews on topics that matter to you. If you like what you've heard on today's episode, check out the liner notes or to learn more about this vibrant community that celebrates women over 50, please visit fabulousat50.com. That's www.fabulousat50.com.